welcome to another edition of Healthy Living. I'm Aisha Salihu. Malaria, a disease caused by a plasmodium parasite transmitted by the bite of infected female Anopheles mosquitoes, remains one of the most common and deadly diseases where about half of the world's population is at risk. In Nigeria, more than 1.5 million cases are reported annually. According to the World Health Organization, malaria is a life-threatening disease that is preventable and curable. But in 2019, there was an estimated 229 million cases of malaria worldwide. Children aged under five years are most vulnerable group affected by malaria. In 2019, they accounted for 274,000 of all malaria deaths worldwide. Dr. Neji Ebuta Agbo, a family physician, takes us on the overview of the disease as well as the groundbreaking malaria vaccine rollout. Malaria it's, uh, uh, is a big issue, it's a big, it's a major public health problem uh, globally, although Africa is disproportionately affected with more than 94% of cases occurring uh, basically in Africa. We, every year, we estimate that uh, about 220, 230 million people are affected uh, globally. And uh, most of this, as we said earlier, in sub-Saharan Africa. And Nigeria contributes a significant burden to this. Out of these 230, 20 million people, we estimate that about 400,000 mm -hmm. uh, plus uh, so far the worst outcome, which is death. And of these 400 and something thousand, uh, 420, there are about 1,000 people who die every year of malaria. We estimate that uh, most of them are children under five, essentially, accounting for about 60, 70% or three, uh, two quarter of that number. So malaria is definitely a big issue. It's responsible for loss of man hours. In a, in a country like Nigeria, if you look at the demographics, we have a population of 200 million uh, Nigerians. We expect that every year at least over 100 million cases of malaria are reported. If you look at uh, demographics based on data we have, uh, some states have malaria prevalence uh, in the upwards range of 50% plus. A few states have lower prevalence. In Abuja, for example, some of the most uh, dependable data will suggest that about uh, one in every five residents in Abuja would have malaria at any point in time. So this would manifest as no symptom at all or presenting symptoms. So this has, it's, it goes to say that malaria is a big issue and uh, um, merits attention by all organizations and government or private. Uh, public or private essentially. It's also important to, to remember that in discussing malaria, you cannot discuss it in isolation. It's definitely, uh, there's definitely um, understanding, scientific understanding of its transmission and all of that. We already know that the female Anopheles mosquito is principally responsible for the transmission of malaria. And malaria is actually caused by a parasite. It's a blood parasite, essentially. Uh, there are about five of them that are, are responsible for malaria in, uh, in, the, in, in the world globally, although some of them are more important. The most important species that is most critical as a major cause of malaria is the species called Plasmodium falciparum. Plasmodium falciparum essentially causes more malaria than any other uh, parasite, uh, Plasmodium parasite. It also is almost single-handedly responsible for all severe forms of malaria and accounts for the deaths, the 400 and something thousand deaths that we see globally. The other species, we are, they are equally important, but they are not uh, as uh, significant in terms of contribution to mortality and morbidity are things like Plasmodium malariae, Plasmodium vivax, Plasmodium ovale, and the little known one, number five, Plasmodium nolesi which was uh, recently, not so recent, which was discovered sometimes in the 70s amongst uh, monkeys and have been found to be affecting man. So what happens is that the female Anopheles mosquito bites uh, a, 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 a patient or a person and transmits the 
the parasite. But the female Anopheles mosquito is supposed to have had the parasite in it. So it's not every mosquito bite that will cause malaria transmission because we get a lot of uh, feedback that a person tells you, oh, I just got bitten by a mosquito yesterday. I must have malaria. So it's not all mosquitoes that have uh, the parasite in them. Some of them may not have the parasite. Some may have. So you have first to be bitten by a mosquito that has a parasite in it. And uh, this mosquito will now transmit it. Immediately biting a patient, the mosquito transmits the plasmodium species into the patient. And within 30 minutes of the plasmodium species entering the blood of the patient, it finds its way within 30 minutes to the liver. By the time it gets to the liver, it invades the liver cells, starts multiplying, and over a variable period, sometimes between 7 to 9 to 14 days, depending on the species. So that means within 1 to 2 weeks, it would multiply uh, enough to transmit to the blood cells, which will go into other circles. So from the, from the liver cells, they go to the blood cells and they keep multiplying until the parasite load mm -hmm. in the patient builds up to a high amount and then the patient starts having symptoms. So what happens is that the patient would have the fever, the chills, the shaking, the sweating, the headaches, the joint aches, and to a large extent. It has been shown that some of these symptoms come like in a cyclical manner. So sometimes your patient will notice, oh, I get this fever only in the evenings every day. It's because the time the fever comes up is associated with when the parasite is being released from within the blood cell and stimulates the immune cells, the immunity of the person, stimulates the temperature regulatory centers of the patient and the person develops fever. And then after the parasite load drops momentarily, the fever goes away and you wait for the next cycle, which can be in one day, in two days or in three days, depending on the species. So patients would have all kinds of symptoms, but I've talked about most of them. Some of the symptoms are life-threatening. So we can, based on symptoms, we can talk about uncomplicated malaria, and we can talk of severe malaria. Uncomplicated malaria is a typical malaria that most people would have. You would feel funny, you would feel headache, you would feel joint pains, you would have fever, you would feel cold, you would shake, you would sweat. And then you may just generally feel weak. If you have these symptoms, then yeah, it may suggest malaria as other conditions also may give the same symptom. So to a large extent, that is uncomplicated malaria. But malaria may become complicated when it has caused more than the usual symptoms that I have listed earlier. And this, when it becomes complicated, it is classified as severe malaria. Now, the thing with severe malaria that it affects mainly sub-group sub, sub of people, usually children under five, whose immunity have not like been built up over time. Because after the age of five, your immunity increases. Pregnant women too are also at risk. They have a low immunity because pregnancy itself uh, suppresses your immunity to malaria. Other set of people who have low immunity are people from other countries where they don't have malaria. So when we have visitors from the West, visitors from countries that do not have malaria, they are at risk of severe malaria uh, to a large extent. Then if you have people who even have been in Nigeria or have been in malaria area, but have left malaria area for as much as five years or more, they lose that protective immunity. So again, they are also at risk. But be that as it may, even people outside this population that have been exposed may still develop severe malaria. And the symptoms of severe malaria include, in addition to the symptoms I've listed previously, we include symptoms like a shortage of blood. We call it severe anemia. The patient's blood drops so much that the patient may even go to heart failure. You can also have kidney failure from malaria. You can also have uh, pulmonary infections, that is infections of the lungs, where the lungs are inflamed, you have a pneumonia. You can also have what you call clotting abnormalities. So the patient starts losing blood, bleeding. It may even simulate what you call hemorrhagic fever, things like Lassa fever, where the patient seems to be bleeding and all of that. And then also, in addition to that, patients may have uh, involvement of the brain. And that would manifest as a convulsion. So recurrent convulsions may be... Some patients may even go into coma 
and that would also that's one of the symptoms in fact coma is can be classically described as one of the key symptoms in severe malaria especially among children but even when you see all of these symptoms the WHO recommends that you should have a laboratory test that shows that the person is positive for the plasmodium falciparum which is the most important falciparum is the commonest cause of malaria and the major or singular cause of severe malaria as described by most authorities so severe malaria is a big issue it can cause death quickly a lot of the patients if they do not have a intervention may die because they may continue losing blood their kidneys may shut down liver may fail blood abnormalities may emerge and then they may just uh, even be unconscious and then aspirate so for in terms of uh, intervention the interventions that are required for both uh, uncomplicated malaria and severe malaria have some similarity but as you would agree both each the gravity of each conditions vary so interventions should be uh, responsive so for patients with uncomplicated malaria you would uh, it is logical to assume that even simple oral tablets anti-malarial tablets are recommended now who has sponsored several studies including local studies which have the described resistance to certain drugs that is why it is recommended that the ideal treatment for malaria is atemisinin combination therapy so not a single medication two medications combined and one of them must always be atemisinia atemisinia derivatives are things like atemita ateita and a couple of uh, atesunates uh, but they are derivative of atemisinia atemisia anoa it's a species of plant that has been used for over 2000 years in treatment of malaria and other conditions in by the chinese and sometimes in the 70s and in the 80s uh, professor yu yu tu who later went on to win the Nobel Prize for, for medicine, um, discovered the potency of Artemisinia and NOAA derivatives in treatment for malaria. So that is critical. So WHO recommends that those derivatives with another medication. So in our claim, what the National Guideline for Malaria Treatment recommends is that you combine that with Lumefantrine which is a fantrain group medication or you combine it with uh, amodiaquine other combinations exist like piperaquine and uh, fancida and uh, doxycycline and clindamycin so there are def several adaptations but the principle is that when you are treating uncomplicated malaria it should be an artemisinin based combination therapy that's where you hear the popular word act now that's for uncomplicated malaria yeah there are certain adjustments to that but that's the general principle for severe malaria it's like we say it's a life-threatening condition so it would require um, very um, very deliberate interventions and uh, usually we say rec parenteral medication so when you say parenteral medications you talk of medications that are delivered in, by injection either by muzzle injection or vein injection so you get im injection or intravascular injections and the principle usually is to give it until the person feels better a little or recovers from unconsciousness and can take oral then you can switch to oral but generally sometimes some patients just exhaust the those medications so uh, the nigerian the guidelines for malaria treatment uh, recommends that the first drug that is recommended for intravenous treatment is artesunate and these are public documents and they are they are information that should be out there so people are well guided is artesunate and the dose are clearly stated in the guidelines the second recommendation in the absence of artesunate is the use of intramuscular injections but derivatives again of uh, artemisinia anua so that would be ateita or atemita as the case may be in the absence of this the third recommendation is to utilize um, um, quinine, quinine infusions. So quinine infusions have also been shown to be very potent in treating patients with severe malaria. But in addition to parenteral injections and oral medications, you must give supportive care. So supportive care will be things like if the person is unconscious, you have to treat like an unconscious patient, make sure the person does not uh, aspirate 
is vomit, like vomits and takes it in the airway. That would cause death almost immediately. If the person's sugar is low, uh, hypoglycemia is one of the symptoms of severe malaria and is a major cause of death in severe malaria. So you have to correct the sugar. If the blood level is so low, you may need to consider transfusing this patient. If kidneys are shut down or kidney injuries, you must manage it appropriately uh, with the correct. Uh, if the patient is bleeding, you must take measures to arrest the bleeding. If the patient's uh, acidity, blood acidity level is excessive, you must ameliorate all of that. The idea is that once you treat a patient for malaria, the patient should not have malaria. You must empower the patient with the information. So in preventing malaria, there are several, several, several interventions. Some of the key interventions, of course, will be, will be direct uh, derivatives from how malaria is transmitted. So number one is that uh, um, we need to prevent mosquito bites. How do we prevent mosquito bites? You can, one of the most critical intervention is the use of insecticide treated mosquito net, the long lasting ones. They are available. They have been shown to reduce malaria transmission by as much as 50% and above. And I think that every well-meaning uh, government, uh, non-governmental organization should see that as an opportunity to impact on the health of uh, Nigerians generally. Mm -hmm. Apart from the long-lasting mosquito nets, we need people to net their house, net their house properly. Netting the house properly is very critical too. It prevents the, the direct uh, inflow of uh, mosquitoes, who some of them are dogs, some of them are down mosquitoes and all that, uh, and coming into the home and biting these patients. And when you have mosquitoes within your house, you must terminate their by using uh, anti, um, anti mosquito um, um, insecticides that are very organophosphates and the rest that have been shown to be effective in controlling um, malaria or mosquito transmission within the house. Proper clothing is also important for people who go out. And then there, are, of course, there are other major, major interventions which can be at the community level. We can also talk about the use of preventive medications like chemoprophylaxis. So people who come from outside the country uh, would probably need chemoprophylaxis. They will need medications that would cut down their risk of developing malaria. Even pregnant women, the WHO recommends that every month they should be taking medication to cut down malaria in pregnant women and children under five. There are some subpopulations where the use of uh, preventive medications have been shown to be useful. Example for children under five who are HIV positive, the use of septrin has been shown to prevent malaria in that population. But at the community level, obviously government would need to work with uh, the local community stakeholders to improve hygiene, water drainage, because if you don't have a place where the mosquitoes can uh, populate and uh, replicate and transmit from, you would cut down that population. So hygiene, Proper water drainage is also critical. Cutting shrubs and bushes around the house is also critical. Fumigation of wide areas is also very critical in the control in the public. We are having a lot of challenge over this mosquito of 18. And by the grace of God, many of us don't know where to run to. If not, so if you can see, you can see all the gutters. Like me personally, I used to clean this gutter almost every week to make sure that the environment is calm and genetic. But since that the rain stop, you know, the, the water cannot flow. And that is why I see a lot of fishes standing here. My children, I used to treat them almost every month, malaria. Both the adult, both the big, both the small. We are having a lot of challenges over the malaria. And we know it's mosquitoes. Many times you see our poor fan put all these mosquitoes going to pursue them away. Every blessed they will do it, we cannot, they cannot stay. I just treated malaria, not quite long, just, I just recovered fully, just two weeks ago, and uh, it was not easy, seriously, it was not easy. I don't know if I have to start saying my experience, but when the whole thing started, I wasn't this, this uh, injection and drip kind of person before, I preferred to go for drugs, and, uh, so when it started, I bought drugs. I noticed that I was not getting it. Then I have the, the, the nurse who come to the house to treat me. So I invited her when I saw that the stuff was not reducing. I invited her and uh, she gave me the test. She gave me some injections and uh, drew back. The crazy part of the whole thing was I thought I was going to be fine. But the more I received this treatment, the more 
the situation was getting worse you get so he got to the point that i had to call another doctor from another clinic who came to the house and it was still the same thing i was not getting it so a lot of people advised that i go to the hospital and i just went to the hospital the standard hospital and they told me that the treatment they've been giving me is below the level of the, uh, i don't know how to put it the malaria level i have is higher than the treatment i'm receiving now so how then they started the treatment and two three days i, I became fine and everything just went down that's just my experience i was very lucky because i first of all went for tests so i knew exactly it was malaria when the result came out i think a lot of people don't actually do that um, people i think a lot of people die because most of these people just get drugs from pharmacies and other places and just start taking them without proper medication yeah so i think a lot of enlightenment need to be done to people about um, getting tested before any treatment large areas of africa and south asia and parts of central and south america the Caribbean, Southeast Asia, and the Middle East and Oceania are considered areas where malaria transmission occurs. We'll take a quick break now and we'll be right back. Do stay with us. Development of vaccine and the fight against malaria has been proven to be a game changer and should be administered to children in all moderate to high transmission areas, of course, subject to availability of supplies. We welcome with open arms the recent announcement by WHO on the progress and the adoption of the first uh, uh, malaria vaccine that has been has gone to post-marketing survey levels, example, especially, I think precisely, the RTS SA S01 vaccine, which was uh, the result of over 30 years of global effort, driven mainly by JSK, supported by the Malaria Vaccine Initiative, with significant support recently by the Belinga, with the, by the Bill and Melinda Gates uh, Foundation to see it through. But uh, also important is the role of the European Medical Association, which in 2015 gave a significant uh, boost by approving this vaccine, but uh, WHO recently adopted it. And it's important to also point out that WHO's adoption of this particular vaccine was as a fallout of the 2019 research uh, which uh, involved over 800,000 African children caught across several locations uh, in Africa,
from West Africa to East and to South Africa, precisely Ghana, Malawi, and Kenya were involved in this study. And what the study showed was that children who had three, who had four vaccine shots, three shots with a booster, were significantly protected. In that population, for example, who had this vaccine, the 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 the, the RTS SA zero SA S zero one vaccine, also called Muscurix Muscurix vaccine, it was showed that severe malaria was reduced by as much as thirty percent. If you look at the numbers of deaths in the African subregions, which is being put at between maybe two fifty to two eighty thousand, let's say two seventy thousand. Uh, deaths of on, of children, mainly on the five children as a result of severe malaria, and you counterpose that against the fact that the Muscurix, this new vaccine, has been shown to reduce uh, severity, uh, cases of severity by as much as 30 percent, 30% plus. That tells us that uh, with the deployment of this vaccine, we can reduce the number of deaths by as much as 80,000. So we we'll have 80,000 less deaths from malaria. This is in addition to a reduction by as much as 60% reduction in malaria case presentation. So overall, we welcome the, the, the adoption of this vaccine. And we're also happy to know that the UNAIDS and the, the Global Fund Against Tuberculosis, Malaria and AIDS is also partnering with Gavi, which is a, a global alliance for vaccination to deploy at least 10 million vaccines in the next couple of uh, months or year, in the next, in the nearest future to areas of need within Africa. For those who know how vaccines work, you know, it helps the body to develop resistance. Uh, the only funny part is that the mosquitoes will go out of business, definitely. But the good thing is that the vaccine would help to decimate the number of um, persons that are being killed by um, the virus, the malaria um, parasite virus. And most importantly, it would also help the funds that are being used to combat this can be diverted to other areas of human development. So I'm, I'm enthusiastic, although I'm cautiously optimistic, but I think it's a step in the right direction. Malaria is not just a medical problem, it is a socio-economic development challenge. The disease causes stunting among those who suffer it at a young age. The support of malaria leadership in the country is a route towards a malaria-free future. We must remember, zero malaria starts with me and you. Thanks for watching today's edition of Healthy Living. I'm Aisha Salihu.